Last speaker in this session demanding the circular economy is Rosalind Skillen. Um, Rosalind joined Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful in February of this year, having studied French and Spanish in Cambridge. She seeks to demonstrate how communication, creativity and storytelling can help address the climate crisis. She campaigns with various charities and businesses in Northern Ireland to advocate for strong environmental policy and to promote climate action. Um, and she communicates on environmental and social issues in her week weekly column in the Belfast Telegraph. Thank you, Rosalind. John. Yeah, thank you so much for um, inviting me today. Thank you, John. And I'm just going to offer a few reflections on these two themes that kind of came through. So reality and opportunity. And I think today we've talked a lot about reality. And for a lot of people here, it was really refreshing to see that it was really striking in some ways, this idea of disrupting the status quo. And we don't hear a lot about that. So when I was reading the report, the report I was really encouraged by that. And this idea that we cannot continue with cultural addiction to consumerism. And I feel like a lot of people have already said this just elevates the conversation and takes us to kind of a new realm of understanding. Like it's gonna mean a lot less driving, a lot less flying, lower meat and dairy consumption, more walking and cycling. Um, and in some ways for people who are maybe like less familiar with climate, that's a really hard pill to swallow, I think. And that's where the second part of the report for me was so helpful in the sense of opportunity so trying to move away from this green austerity na narrative, which environmentalists are sometimes guilty of in terms of what we have to give up and what we have to lose in this new sustainable future. And instead asking the question about what we have to gain. And I think that's so valuable because the transition to a sustainable future is gonna entail so many different ways of living. But in my view, this is gonna be a better quality of life for most people. It's gonna mean clean air, improved health and well-being, enhanced connection to the world around us and to each other, and a more democratized, localized production of food and energy, for example. So I think in so many ways, as a lot of people have already mentioned, including Peter earlier, the report challenges us to use values in order to engage different audiences about how to transform this reality into the realm of opportunity and to make um, the hard pill to swallow in some ways easier to hear to say, to understand. Um, and a, lo a lot of the work that I do, I work with loads of different groups um, and I've learned quite a lot about how to yeah, change your communication style. I know Joan was talking about that earlier, but for example, um, for the environmental charity I work for in community gardens, the people are not there to like increase biodiversity or reduce carbon. A lot of them are there because they're really lonely because they've got poor levels of mental health and well-being. So a lot of the time we're promoting um, community gardens and climate action then through the lens of health and well-being or maybe social co inclusion or um, cohesion. And then if I'm talking to a faith group, you're trying to tailor the message, not necessarily to do with the climate science, but more with the values and principles of justice and compassion, talking about stewardship and creation care. And then maybe if you're talking to a business, it's about green jobs and the fact that um, more young people are interested in ESG, environmental, social governance. Um, and I think that the report highlights as well the nexus between health and climate, which I think is really interesting. It talks about even the richest people can't say that they don't care about health. Um, and when I was at the climate strike in Dublin a few weeks ago, I found it really interesting that the Irish doctors for the environment were there and they were talking about how um, the climate crisis is gonna impact people's health. No one wants to breathe in dirty air. Um, so again, I think there's just so many different lenses through which we can land this message that are really effective. But I think the big challenge for environmentalists and for people in this room is relating the environment to everyday concerns. So like jobs, skills, food, in a way that engages more people. And it shows us that tackling the climate crisis and tackling inequality aren't mutually exclusive. So it's this challenge in a way to mainstream environmental concerns. Um, and I think when we frame the climate crisis in terms of people's values, we start to explore the more emotional aspects of what moves people to take action. Um, so in many ways, like the head, the heart and the hands. So um, the logical outworkings of why we need to take action, the science behind it, that's the head, the heart landing the message more effectively in terms of values, like adhering to what they um, hold in terms of their value systems and their beliefs. And then that mobilizes the hands that enables people to take action. So the head, the heart and the hands are so, so important. And I just want to conclude by saying what this report makes so obvious and it was highlighted this morning is that 
all of this is a political choice and I feel like so often it feels like this is happening to us and we don't have a sense of agency but um, it's really important to remember that none of this is inevitable and it's a result of private interest being privileged over public interest um, and symptomatic of how vested interests are so so embedded into our political systems and you know we talked about the av aviation industry and the fossil fuel industry who like both of which have a really long history um, of shaping government policy to suit their interests um, but we need to remember that insufficient solutions to climate change are not solutions um, and the gap, not only as the report highlights between reality and opportunity, but between reality and ambition um, are both getting larger. And I think that we can no longer afford to see climate change as a 2030 or a 2050 problem. Um, as people highlighted this morning, Ireland was the second country in the world to declare a state of emergency in 2019 um, about the climate crisis. And I'm sure a lot of people are asking how their lives have changed in any significant, meaningful way. It doesn't feel like we're living in a state of emergency. Um, so I guess to close, I think we really need to respond to the climate and nature crises as if our lives depended on it, John. because they do.